Welcome to Secrets to Selling Your Business, the podcast for entrepreneurs and business owners looking to unlock the secrets behind successful business transitions. Join our host, Jacob Koenig, a partner at Woodbridge International, as he gives you the knowledge to navigate complexities, embrace strategic shifts, and prepare you to sell your business with no regrets. On today's episode, we spoke to Jason Zilvedi, a distinguished financial advisor at Rockefeller Global Family Office, about how business owners can use the sale of their business to create and preserve multi-generational family wealth. And now, here's your host, Jacob Koenig. All right, welcome to the show. Our guest today, I'm excited for the Managing Director uh, and Private Advisor at Rockefeller Global Family Office, Jason Zilvedi. Jason, thanks so much for joining us today. Yeah, no, thanks for having me, Jacob. Look forward to it. Excellent. So you started your career at, at Morgan Stanley, where you quickly became the number one ranked financial advisor within your class. What were some of the, the key strategies and decisions that propelled you to the top so early in your career? Yeah, well, just I guess just backing up from the beginning, I was actually on a more of a pre-med path before meeting my now bride of nearly 20 years. My my grandfather was a doctor in the Air Force, and then my dad was in finance. So kind of always had an interest yeah. and an aptitude for both. The way I looked at it was, why don't I try this finance route, mm-hmm. get into the industry, see if I liked it. And if not, you know, medical school was was still going to be there, you know, four years residency, four years of medical school, you know, two years of fellowship before you mm-hmm. know it, it's you know, a decade long journey. And if you got into it and really didn't like it, you know, you don't get that time back. So thankfully, I guess I would say that, the, you know, the apple didn't fall too far from the tree. I had a, you know, tremendous mentor. I don't think that they have to have your same last name for that to be the case, but just kind of a senior advisor that you can align yourself with and, you know, learn a lot early on uh, was definitely a big, uh, a big help to my, my early success out of the gate. For sure. Yeah. And how did that relationship develop? Was it something that was sort of the, the company said, here's your, your mentor and, and run with it? Or did you reach out first or sort of naturally? Yeah. I mean, you grow up around the dinner table, you know, in your own family, in your own household. And, you know, I think you just, you know, absorb some things from those casual conversations. But yeah, I mean, there was a terrific training program I went through early on, had some great peers, some great mentors along the way. But once I got into this industry, you know, it just, it really clicked from the standpoint of it wasn't this, you know, kind of boring kind of desk job, if you will, that I perceived it to be before I even got into it. It was very much, you know, about relationships, you know, in the business, helping people with, you know, their financial health, you know, or their wealth, as opposed to their physical health, if you're a medical doctor. And so really just serving as that quarterback that helps, you know, coordinate the efforts of, clients, other position players, you know, in tax, legal, estate, insurance, you name it, and really helping them maintain and grow their wealth, you know, and their legacies was definitely something that early on, I felt called to do and still called to do today. Excellent. And you've got a special specialization really in the, the generational family wealth preservation. You know, how do you approach that unique aspect of wealth management? And what, what motivated you to specialize in that aspect? Yeah, well, I mean, I think it's, you know, multi-generational family wealth preservation is a great way to kind of sum up our our team and our practice. And so, you know, I don't know if you're referring to or alluding to some of the initials, you know, after after my name. I mean, that's just, you know, having a quality advisor, you know, in the life of, of say, a business owner is really important because, You know, the SEPA designation, for example, you know, they have a focus on working with business owners in transition. So, you know, that's obviously going to be, you know, a very good thing for a business owner to look for and make sure that they have, you know, oftentimes they spend decades or most of their life trying to build this business Mm -hmm. and, you know, they want it to continue well beyond, you know, not just their kids, but maybe their grandchildren, just future generations. So there's that old adage, you know, shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves in three generations, or I think, you know, rice patties to rice patties in three generations. So trying to help families steward mm-hmm. that wealth wisely is just critically important. So, you know, obviously something that we're passionate about and, and have really, you know, honed in on and made a focus of our practice. Yeah, I mean, that SEPA uh, designation certainly does stand out you know, here at the the Secrets to Selling Your Business podcast. We're always keen to to hear from advisors, you know, the sort of the core elements of that exit planning and why it's crucial for business owners who are preparing for sale or, or even succession. 
Yeah, I mean, and this isn't, you know, it's definitely never going to be a knock on someone's, you know, current advisor, but that, you know, same advisor who might have been perfectly fine, you know, managing the clients, you know, call it million dollars or less for a long, long time, you know, might not be the best person to help the business owner, you know, like I said, steward that, you know, 10 million or 20 million or, you know, 100 million plus cash right. after closing. So, I mean, we've obviously, we've all had loyalties, you know, to others in the past, but, it's, you know, it's simply about what's going to be in the best interest of the business owner, you know, their family and the other people that matter most to them moving forward. So, you know, mm -hmm. if someone's taken the time to get some of that specialized training to help them in that regard, you know, that just speaks to, you know, the ways in which they can probably help them in and through this very important transaction. Mm -hmm. I mean, do you find that there are certain aspects that are sort of more similar among the entrepreneurial entrepreneur clients and business owner clients that differentiate them and sort of the outlook and the way that you approach your advice to them versus, you know, athletes or, or otherwise? Yeah, no, no, there definitely is. I mean, you know, outside of call it maybe marriage, you know, the birth of a child, I think selling a family or privately held business you know, oftentimes rounds out kind of the the big three, you know, if you will, of major life events for a business owner. So it's a really emotional time. I mean, it's not just a, a financial transaction. So, you know, recognizing that, you know, as an advisor, you know, to the process is really critical, you know, having the empathy, the patience and really delivering, you know, sound advice and guidance, you know, mm -hmm. all plays in to the, the dialogue and discussions. Right. So, I mean, what, one analogy that might be helpful for your listeners is, you know, if anyone's a fan of, of video games, you can picture Pac-Man, right? So the business owner up until this point really has a kind of a Pac-Man situation where if you think about the design of that character, the, you know, overwhelming majority of their net worth is often in the business. Mm -hmm. So that would kind of be the body of the Pac-Man. And then there's this small sliver, which would be, you know, Pac-Man's mouth. That's kind of being the, you know, liquid net worth or investable assets. So, you know, retirees are oftentimes the opposite, right? They have a, a really large liquid portfolio that they just need, you know, help structuring and managing, you know, for lifetime income that they can't outlive. And then, you know, athletes, I mean, they're, they're an entirely different category, right? I mean, they've got, yeah. you know, most of them are making, you know, their career yeah. earnings in a very compressed period of time at a very young age. And then, you know, needing to set up their savings right from the beginning with some really sound financial literacy and education, which we're, you know, huge proponents of, you know, here at the firm. So just, you know, the guidance as well with athletes for their second act, right? You know, after they've either, you know, hung up the cleats or shoes or uniform, you know, they oftentimes need to bridge a, you know, mm -hmm. 15 or some cases 25 years or longer gap from retirement from the sport. Yeah. So when, you know, some of their pensions or other retirement accounts may kick in. Right. Almost the inverse, really, in a lot of ways versus a business owner client. And, you know, you mentioned that emotional toll of selling the business. It's something we definitely encounter a lot here advising on the transaction. You know, we always find that when there is a, a really good relationship with the, the wealth advisor, having that sounding board, having that ability to go back to the table mm -hmm. if they're you know, if there, there is an unfortunate downturn in the business or if something needs to get retraded to be able to say, all right, well, how does this really impact the long-term view post-sale? Does, you know, do the economics still make sense? And to have that trusted advisor on the wealth management side, just it makes it a much easier, smoother conversation and, and at least allows us to get through those emotional issues mm -hmm. rather than getting hung up on them. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. I mean, one of the, I think main takeaways for any business owner that's listening to this or any of your other podcasts would just be to, you know, don't go it alone, right? I mean, you really should build the team, you know, and, and starting with a, a quality financial advisor that, you know, specializes in working with business owners in transition like we do, you know, can really help open doors, you know, make the appropriate introductions to other important key professionals Right. that will have their best interests at heart, including like a Woodbridge, you know, a Rockefeller global investment bank, you know, the experienced M&A attorney, the quality CPA. I mean, all these people kind of, you know, rowing in the same direction, in the right direction on behalf of the client is very important. And so, yeah, I mean, related to your point and our work in working with business owners is we'll run 
kind of our own proprietary wealth forecast. You know, basically it's a personalized, you know, goals-based financial plan where, you know, we can model various what-if scenarios, right, with different mm -hmm. sale amounts so that, you know, without kind of showing their hand to a buyer, you know, the owner just has a greater degree of confidence going into any process of, you know, knowing what that number needs to be, kind of the cash at closing to make the math work, you know, to be able to do all the things that are, are really most important to them. And, you know, just as I say that, I, I can think of a, a great example that comes to mind where kind of on the on the smaller scale, we actually helped a, a family go into a process. All indications were that it was going to be kind of like in the seven and a half million dollar range. We went through kind of all the, you know, wants, needs, wishes, et cetera, for the family. You know, it turns out that they could make their plan work at only, you know, call it five to six million you know, if that was the, the sale outcome. Right. So, you know, the client ended up having two buyers that really wanted the company. So they ended up bidding it up and the client ended up receiving more than 10 million from the sale. But the point being that they went into this just kind of knowing what their kind of floor was or what that minimum amount or value would be, where they'd still be okay selling at. If for whatever reason, all the bids and all the, you know, the ultimate LOI, you know, came in lower than originally anticipated. So. Absolutely. Well, that's, that's a great example. And I think it's a, a great example also of showing how uh, competition really plays a part in this, in this whole process of selling your business. You know, when you have one buyer, they really are in the driver's seat. When you've got multiple, you know, two minimum, that allows you to have that competition to be able to get things bid up further and potentially, you know, really, really grasp the, the top possible price value for, for your business. And certainly when it's going in that direction, it's a lot easier of a conversation to be had than uh, than the other direction. I'm curious to hear if you've had any stories where it, where it has been going sort of more in, in the other direction, where maybe there's a downturn or, or we find something out in diligence, you know, looking back at something we've been dealing with a lot lately, aged inventory, and how the, the books have been looking at that. Are, are your margins really correct? You know, these things sometimes do come up as surprises, even to the business owners. And when you're in the midst of everything and, and suddenly the numbers change, how do you address that? And how, how do you work through those problems on, on a high level? Going back to obviously the, the outlay that you've had at the beginning, that must make a huge difference in having those conversations later on, I'd imagine. Yeah, no, it, I mean, unless a business owner has really gone through a full sales process before, I mean, they, they generally don't have a a great sense of really all the steps involved, right? From, you know, the initial teasers to the indications of interest, all the management meetings, the due diligence, m &A attorneys, LOI, the eventual closing, I mean, all of that, mm. right? And just the amount of time that it takes. So, I mean, business owners can't control where they fall, right? Like where the range of multiples up or down will move over time. But what they do have some degree of control over is kind of where they fall on that range of multiples. I mean, if they're running a, a very well-oiled machine, I mean, they may be able to command kind of a premium valuation. And conversely, if, you know, there's a lot of things that, you know, a buyer can pick at in diligence, maybe they, you know, fall down towards the lower end of that range. But, you know, Jacob, the reality is that every every single business owner is going to have an exit, right? I mean, you, you hope that it's, you know, not due to one of the, you know, so-called dreaded Ds like, you know, death or divorce or disability, so what we'll generally advocate is, you know, for business owners to take steps now to really be in the position to go to market when mm -hmm. they want to. And then essentially, we're just adopting kind of an interval training type mentality where mm -hmm. every 90 days, you know, we just decide, hey, are we going to keep mm -hmm. it and grow it or do we want to sell it? And so, you know, the point being is it's just wise to start incorporating some of these kind of value acceleration <laughs> methodologies, if you will, and removing some of those obstacles that might create challenges for a business owner or, you know, a potential buyer to get to get over so that when they finally do decide that the timing's right to, you know, ring the bell or, you know, take some chips off the table, diversify their net worth, there's less or fewer objections, you know, that could come up along the way. And so just having that mindset, of course, you know, I've had situations where the business owner does begin the process, does go to market and, you know, issues can and do arise and come up. And so they may decide to just, you know, pause, yeah. you know, a process and, and revisit it, you know, later on that year, the following year, 
but that kind of mindset, like I said, that interval training has, has proven to be, you know, quite helpful with the clients that we've worked with. That's really fascinating. I mean, you start this sort of 90 day check-in at what point in the life cycle of, you know, your, your relationships with a business owner, do you start that? Is it right away or is it something that, that you sort of evolve into over time? Yeah, well, like I said, I mean, it's it's very much um, a relationships business. You know, people generally, at least in my experience, don't care, you know, how much you know until they know how much you care, right? Exactly. And so it's it's building that rapport. It's getting to understand what their main issues and concerns are. You know, ultimately, what do they, you know, still want to accomplish, you know, personally, professionally? What does legacy look like and mean to them? You know, things along that line. And then you know, just it comes up naturally over the course of dialogue and discussions about getting into their business, what they do want to accomplish, and then just advocating for, you know, a thoughtful process versus just, hey, you know, I'm going to go sell my company to my buddy or my competitor down the street because they're the most logical buyer. Well, yeah. maybe, but <laughs> that's definitely one of those misconceptions is that that a business owner thinks they know, you know, many or most or all of the best buyers for their business or that they you know, decide that they just want to negotiate directly one-on-one, -on -one, yeah. you know, with a uh, potential acquirer. Yeah. Jason, you make a great point there. You know, what we found in, in our history and 30 years of, of helping business owners to sell their companies, I think it's something like 95% did not know the buyer, the ultimate buyer prior to contacting us, you know, especially in this lower middle market space, there are literally hundreds of thousands of potential buyers and where you might have these billion dollar transactions where there, there really are legitimately only a handful of potential buyers in our space of the market, that's just not the case. And so it really comes down to defining the, the alpha of the company, and really marketing that out to the, the large potential universe of buyers to drum up that demand. And then, as you said, get a competitive situation in place that can really help to drive the value. So it's a really great point. And again, having those conversations and, and having that, I think, thought process arise naturally. Oftentimes we do hear buyers getting, or I'm sorry, clients getting the idea of selling their company because they were approached by, say, their competitor or their buddy. And, and I think a lot of people do go down that road to try and do it themselves. And what you find is that that leads really to a distraction. And when you get distracted from running your business, that's where you might have a pitfall where you do have to have this difficult conversation midway through a transaction where the, the numbers are coming off. So it's definitely a lot better to have someone in, in your corner. And as you said, to build that team ahead of time so that, that you're prepared and can, can deal with anything, but also keep an eye and, and keep your focus where it needs to be, which is the performance of the, the business. Yeah, again, I mean, I just think negotiating, you know, directly one on one with a buyer, you know, that approaches, you know, a business owner with an unsolicited offer, at least again, in my experience, and it sounds like yours as well, you know, oftentimes won't result in the best outcome for the business owner. I mean, I can, I can think of numerous examples, but one that just comes right to mind was you had a client, you know, years ago, say, Call me saying, hey, Jason, you know, received an unsolicited offer to, to sell my company for $30 million. And I said, you know, that's great. Terrific. But before you do, and then, you know, went through and explained this whole process of engaging a quality investment bank like a Woodbridge or like a Rockefeller Global Investment Banking to run a tight professional, you know, global auction process to create that competitive tension and really maximize the outcome for the business owner. So, the shorter version of a longer story is that same client, you know, ended up receiving their cash proceeds at closing of over $60 million wired into their account. Wow. And so, you know, after the fact, they leveled with me. They said, hey, Jason, we were never just going to blindly sell our company for $30 million. But, you know, yeah. even on our best day, we didn't think we'd, you know, flirt with 50. Wow. So it speaks to, you know, the value add of, you know, yeah. assembling the right team. Indeed. All right. So Jason, could you elaborate a little bit more about uh, some of the customized strategies that Rockefeller uses for, you know, to fit the individual needs of, of your clients? Yeah, no, absolutely. So, you know, in addition to those kind of proprietary wealth forecasts that I alluded to earlier, you know, these, these personalized kind of goals-based financial plans or financial analysis, you know, our team's a really strong advocate or proponent of, of kind of a bucket approach where, you know, we have a few strategies for the business owner to consider as, you know, they're looking at their long-term planning. So 
the first bucket would just be, you know, like a cash or liquidity bucket. So here you're just, you know, you're thinking short term, you know, or immediate needs, you know, for planning for the client's lifestyle right now. So essentially money for known, you know, upcoming expenses for the next, you know, call it couple of years. And then, you know, the second bucket would be, you know, thinking through your lifetime needs. And so we're in baseball season right now, so I can use a baseball analogy. I mean, these are just kind of, you know, the singles and doubles that you're looking to hit up the middle with the assets that you have. And, you know, obviously want them to grow and to be able to last, you Mm -hmm. know, your entire, you know, lifetime. And so, you know, once those two needs are met or once those, you know, kind of first two buckets are, are adequately filled, the third one would be, you know, just thinking for, you know, needs that go beyond your own, right? Mm-hmm. So this would be, you know, more of the quote unquote legacy bucket where you can afford to be a little bit more kind of growth oriented or opportunistic in order to fund things for, you know, crid, for kids, for grandkids, you know, church, charity, et cetera, whatever, whatever the causes or, you know, kind of organizations and people that you're most passionate about. I mean, obviously with that last bucket, you know, if it went to zero, you know, no one would be happy about it, but it wouldn't have, you know, the impact on kind of those first two where that's really kind of cash needed for your own lifetime. So I just think, Jacob, that that, you know, relatively straightforward and simple framework has, again, in our experience, really resonated with not only the business owner, but, you know, the business owner, their spouse or significant other, you bring them in together, sit them down for a meeting and kind of lay out that framework, you know, they can get their arms around that since this is a kind of a new and exciting time for them. Yeah, for sure. It makes it, it makes a ton of sense as well, you know, to have that set aside there, you can really swing for the fences with the ones that are longer term and, and focus more on, uh, on the immediate needs as well as, as the, the intermediate just uh, seems like a really great starting point. Yeah. Well, and if, and if it's done properly and it's well-structured. And Jason, just to, to sort of step back a little bit, you know, you've actually personally been recognized by the likes of Forbes, for instance, multiple times. I'm just curious to hear what, what does that level of recognition mean to you personally and professionally? You're trying to make me blush, aren't you? No, it's, no, it, it's, it's humbling, Jacob. I mean, I'm, I'm super grateful. I've been, you know, blessed with terrific, you know, teammates and clients past and present over the years that that helps make it all possible. And so, yeah, I never get cu- too caught up on, you know, any of the, you know, headlines or press releases or anything like that. But yeah, definitely grateful, like I said, for, you know, all the terrific clients and, and teammates, you know, along the way. Yeah, well, I appreciate the humility there. I mean, I think that's, it's an important aspect of good leadership to show that, you know, you're not all about the ego and and certainly when selling a company as a related point, it's something that we often do say the entrepreneurs are, are oftentimes, you know, beating their chest, look at how great, how great the company is, how great my involvement has been and to sell it well, you know, you do have to take that step back and, and actually focus more on how the company can run without you. Since that's ultimately what you're what you're selling to someone else, that is oftentimes a difficult step. Yeah, no, hundred percent, hundred percent. So, yeah, I would just say that you know it, it definitely helps. You know, you trying to be you know the best listener possible and truly you know understanding what those you know goals or issues or concerns that you're solving for, you know, at every stage along the way, and then helping people just like I said, steward you know steward these resources that they've been you know blessed with and entrusted with you know wisely. Those are definitely key, but yeah, I just, I I've appreciated, you know, getting to know, you know, some of the folks at, at your firm at Woodbridge, obviously here within Rockefeller Global Family Office, just a great culture, great environment, and, you know, allows us to, to do what we do. Well, Jason, that was all I had uh, prepared to ask for you today. Is, is there anything else that you wanted to, to leave with the audience before we finished up? I think we touched on a lot of points that would be helpful to them. You know, I think the the financial planning piece is is definitely foundational for a business owner, just again, with such a large amount of their net worth, you know, generally being pretty illiquid or tied up in the business uh, early on, you know, helping them work through just kind of overall wealth and estate planning, you know, options, you know, obviously in conjunction with quality tax and legal advisors, because at the end of the day, it's generally not how much they make, but how much they keep, right? You know, net of taxes or any, net of any, you know, costs associated with the transaction. And so, you know, helping them kind of navigate the landscape around taxes, you know, wealth transfer, et cetera, are all things that, 
I think a business owner should be asking of their current advisor. And if that current advisor does not know, it might make sense just to get a, a quality, you know, second opinion, second opinion service from, from someone else as well. So again, I really am grateful for, for the opportunity to be on, on your podcast. I enjoy listening to it weekly and I wish you guys continued success and all the best. Yeah, and, and same to you, Jason. Jason Zolvetti, Managing Director and Private Advisor at Rockefeller Global Family Office. Thanks again so much for joining us today. Thank you for listening to another episode of Secrets to Selling Your Business, the podcast for entrepreneurs and business owners looking to unlock the secrets to successful business transitions. Here's a brief recap of our conversation with Jason Zilvetti. One, implementing value acceleration methodologies can enhance a business's value, making it more appealing to potential buyers. Two, business owners should assemble a team of financial professionals when preparing for a sale as these experts provide personalized financial plans and ongoing support. Three, it's wise to engage investment banks for business acquisitions because they maximize the value of the company through competitive processes and tailored strategies. We hope you enjoyed listening to this week's guests and their insights. If you like what you hear, please consider subscribing wherever you listen to podcasts. Woodbridge, where transforming the lives of business owners is our passion.